Alright, so with last week, uh, at least as far as the time in which I'm shooting this, saw the uh, 75th anniversary of D-Day, they decided to re-release Saving Private Ryan in theaters for a few days, and I was able to see it uh, in that way, which I hadn't before. Uh, and that's when I figured it was probably good in time to do this video, which we've been saying we were going to do since I think I started this however many years ago. So, um, And there was a lot of discussion about which one would go up against which, because uh, I heard like a while back I think somebody wanted the Thin Red Line with something that was a bit more like in the same con contemplative field that it was. Uh, and then Saving Private Ryan with something a bit more in line with it, like Flags of Our Fathers. Uh, I think I'll probably look at Flags of Our Fathers with Letters from Iwo Jima. Um, because, much like Flags of Our Fathers and Letters from Iwo Jima, I kind of see these both as... Because th they're obviously seen not only coming from two totally different directors, coming from two totally different places at the time. Um, but to me, even though they've been built up as being, you know, their outlook on the subject matter being so different... I kind of think they go perfectly together. Like, together, they kind of feel like one full entire experience. Because Saving Private Ryan is mostly known for being the more visceral, visceral approach and really showing, particularly the opening scene, how it was um, so graphic and supposedly so accurate that when I remember when it first came out in 98, you kept hearing the stories about veterans going to see it and actually having to leave the theater because it was just too much. Um, like, it was it was almost too accurate, um, and brought back all those memories. And then The Thin Red Line was always considered sort of less of that and more about uh, being a more meditative experience uh, on that war. But while, while that's true, and while I do think putting those two things together makes a complete experience, um, I do also think that Saving Private Ryan is overlooked a little bit in regards to uh, just how contemplative it can be in regards to the war itself, and The Thin Red Line, while being seen as the more meditative movie, can be overlooked in just how well it does the war scenes also. Because um, it's got some really visceral battle, battle scenes of its own, so um, there is that. So I figure we'll just kind of, usually I do one and then the other, but I figure this is one of those cases where we kind of bounce back and forth and compare like certain things that both movies pulled off or took a different approach to entirely. The first thing, when you talk about uh, Spielberg and Malick coming from two totally different places to make two totally different movies, um, you can first start off by looking at the fact that Spielberg, especially at this time in 98, um, was just about as big as he could possibly be. Uh, he had done about two Jurassic Parks at this point. Um, just about five years prior, he had done Schindler's List and Jurassic Park at the same time, and just was the name synonymous with Blockbuster. Um, which he still is, though he's gone much more into kind of the historical stuff and stayed there. Um, just this name that's basically associated with the big blockbuster movies. And Malick was coming off um, a really, really long absence. Like, over 20 years, we're talking. Um, where he had made a movie and then just disappeared off the face of the earth, seemingly. Um, and then it kind of slowly got built up that he might be coming back, and it might be The Thin Red Line, which had already been, which was a novel by James Jones that had already been made into a movie with uh, Kira DeLay from 2001. Um, but that one was like a much more straightforward war movie, and Kira DeLay kind of being the main focus, he, his character was the one that uh, Dash Miok plays in this to show you just how much Mal took the much more ensemble approach. Um, so when you talk, when, so right away, but in that at, in that aspect, we can see just how different things are gonna feel until we actually see the movies themselves. But I do think they have more in common than they're giving credit for when you really, really look into them. Um, one of the things, um, speaking of Saving Private Ryan being what's considered to be the more visceral of the two, mainly because of its opening scene, um, which I think just about everything at least I've heard. Um, says from much more experienced people in this area um, that it's like the closest you can get to uh, at least the chaos and the feel um, of what that whole experience may have been like um, at least as much as we're going to see it through a video camera on a movie set um, is going to give us that feeling as close as we can um, or as close as they can um, but there was a while there, I think it's kind of subsided, but there was a while there where um, I felt like Saving Private Ryan might have been getting, I don't know if backlash is the right word, but it started kind of becoming a popular opinion that 
the only thing that made Saving Private Ryan the movie that it is in movie history was the opening scene, and that the rest is lackluster by comparison. Um, I'm kind of glad that that argument has subsided a little bit because I never thought it was true. Um, there's a lot that Saving Private Ryan has going for, and I think a lot of that is um, how well it treats its characters. Because when you start off... Um, because the thing that the Thin Red Line does about using its characters and how we see them is, yeah, in Private Ryan we do kind of get to know each individual character and we kind of get to see how their brother and camaraderie was close. It's sometimes closer in circumstances like uh, how Mellish and Caparzo seemed uh, kind of closer that you can kind of branch off as they were closer to each other than maybe other people in the group. But then there was also um, Miller and Horvath seemed kind of there was kind of a bit of a partnership there also, despite the fact that they were all certainly, you know, just one group. But the thing also is that we got, you know, their backgrounds and they were established really well and we could kind of feel like we knew them in a sense uh, as the movie kept going. Um, the Thin Red Line does take a very different approach, which is when I talked about the ensemble aspect and the way it jumps around, um, the fact that we literally get inside the characters' heads because... I do feel like we know the characters in Private Ryan a lot better than we know the characters in the Thin Red Line because there is still, like, we may not know entirely where a lot of them are coming from. We, like, we may get backstory on, like, um, like Ben Chaplin consistently has the sort of cerebral, cerebral flashbacks, cerebral flashbacks uh, to Holm and his wife and all that before that whole storyline happens and that reveal. Um, and we do, but we do actually get inside their heads and know how they feel, like in the moment, uh, like when they're actually in the middle of war. So, that, <laughs> yeah, I guess you could argue we may know more about them just by that alone than we wouldn't say getting the backstories of the other characters. Um, but the way Pryoran really does deal with the individual characters, and while I understand that Thin Red Line could definitely, arguably, have a more, I guess, intimate approach. Um, there is just watching the individual moments that these characters get throughout. Um, like, um, M Mellish stands out a lot. M another thing that's also kind of haunted me about Mellish ever since uh, I've seen this uh, many times over already is... if One thing that stands out about Mellish that people will probably point out first and foremost um, is his unforgettable death scene. Um, which is really brutal and how like slowly it happens uh, and how it's just an image that just sticks in your head forever. Um, but the thing that I think makes that even more disturbing is that we actually get to see the moment in the movie that technically Mellish's fate is sealed. Um, we just don't realize it at the time, and it's done really nonchalantly. Where it's after um, the beach scene has happened, and they're gathering up, and they're, they've just gotten their mission to go get Ryan, and Miller's deciding who's going to go with them, and so he's deciding, you know, Horvath and Wade and all them, and Jackson... Um, and then he says a guy named, his last one is a guy named Beasley, until he's informed that Beasley's dead, and then just right off the top of his head he says, okay, Mellish then. And it's like, between Miller learning that Beasley was dead, was the one moment that Mellish didn't have the faith that he does. And it's like, just that one moment that it happens so casually has always been kind of disturbing to me, despite how nonchalant it is when it goes by at the beginning, knowing what we know by the end of the movie, so that's, that's always been really tragic. Um, and the way we also get, uh, like, the individual emotion between them, like, um, I guess staying on Mellish, uh, we got the scene right after the opening battle has just ended, uh, and he and Caparzo are kind of joking around, like, Caparzo finds the Hitler youth knife, and they make some jokes back and forth, and then Mellish just breaks down. Like, the fact that he can go from laughing and joking around to breaking down just it, within a second, uh, because of the environment they're in, um, just really shows something right off, and the whole seeing Miller and how his hands shake and how he just seems constantly on the verge of a breakdown, but he's got to, because he's the leader of this group, he's got to really stand his ground, and because it's basically his duty to remain stone-faced and lead them. Um, but the fact that in, like, you know, Tom Hanks' eyes and the way he moves, we can just see the breaking down happening, and then the scene in the middle when he basically confesses to them, because he's been kind of hiding his what his life was before this, and when he explains to them that he was really just a teacher and that he's such a changed person by all this and he's seen so much at this point that he's terrified that his wife won't even recognize him when he comes home. 
which is really powerful stuff. And that's another thing that I think uh, Prior Ryan doesn't get much credit for is people kind of assume because there's so much action in it um, that the dialogue might not be that great or the dialogue might not be a priority. Um, but uh, with Robert Redout writing it, um, I do think there's a lot in there where, like I said, it's probably a more contemplative movie than it gets credit for. Even though Spielberg does take the approach of telling the story and showing the emotion much more through visuals and the action itself. Um, but when we do have these moments, uh, like, you know, Miller talking about that, or Wade talking about his mom in the church, and just them kind of giving these little, you know, letting us get in their heads a little bit or in their paths. Um, but I think another thing that's really strong in the writing is how they treat Ryan throughout the movie versus after they find him. Um, where, like, there's this, especially with Edward Barnes's character, there's, like, this constant resentment um, where they know that the the reasonings, basically, uh, that Harvey Presnell would send them to do this uh, when they're here for another job entirely, um, to go get one guy at the expense of potentially all eight of them. Um, and it's very clear, and he makes it very clear throughout the movie, um, just where exactly a resentment can come from that. Um, and then he, and he's obviously feuding with Miller a lot over it and always, you know, I guess threatening to defy him and basically leave the whole mission and all that. Um, which makes it even more beautiful when he's the one there as, uh, one of the ones there as Miller is dying and we see just how much of, you know, respect he had for them, had for him overall. Um, but even so, leading up to this, uh, he's the one that's kind of the most sort of, like the only time... Like, it's after they found Ryan, and it's right before um, the final battle scene with the bridge, where it's, uh, he's kind of telling the story about the woman that he met prior to this, and it's like the one time that we kind of see Edward Burns not so intense uh, throughout the movie, and it's, and it's because there's this contrast of when he finally does meet Ryan, this person he's resented this whole time, and they've already lost uh, Wade and Carpazzo because of him, um, because of this mission, I guess you could say. Um, but then there's that moment where he, once Ryan is informed of what's happened to his brothers and that the mission is to get him out of there and take him home, uh, his, his refusal and the fact that he has his own brotherhood here and brothers that he refuses to leave behind and abandon, um, you can kind of immediately see the shift where everyone starts to have more of an understanding of he's... He's in. He is one of us, just in a different situation. Uh, like he may not have been there for the beach, um, but he's already established, you know, just as much of a brother here. Especially since his real life brothers, he now has. He has no more now. Like that's what started this whole thing off. Um, and then there's that. We kind of see that understand unspoken understanding between them um, when he like saves his life uh, during this final battle, and we kind of see the that they're on the same page, and I think that's just really, really beautiful character work with Edward Burns' character. Um, and that's a lot in the writing, too, so I don't think it gets enough credit for stuff like that. Um, and then we do have we do have stuff like um, Caparza also, who doesn't have a lot of screen time. Um, it's also one of Vin Diesel's earliest roles. Um, where they all kind of have that one... They all they all have those human moments, but they're, a lot of them have that one particular moment um, and with Caparzo, it's the moment when he's, just before he's killed, he wants to save the girl because it reminds him of his niece. Um, and I like the thing that Caparzo sets off here that's a common thing throughout the movie. Um, and that's the letter uh, to his parents, or to his dad specifically, that he has on him. Um, and while he dies trying to save this girl, um, and I was, I always thought there was like a music cue there. It wasn't until I saw it in the theater that I really got a look, good look and realized that after he's hit, he lands on a piano, and that's what that sound is, um, which is kind of haunting in itself, just the sound of it. But um, this letter that um, he's trying to get to his dad, that as he dies, Wade is able to take from him and basically retranscribe it to send off. But then just the way it kind of constantly changes hands until it inevitably ends up in Ryan's hands. Um, it's like there's still that sort of connection between Ryan and a character he never met. Um, and how it, it takes Ryan, who he never met and who this mission was for, um, to get that letter to where it was supposed to be. Because it goes from Carpazzo to Wade, and then as Wade's dying, Miller takes it. Then as Miller dies, 
Ryan takes it, and then I, I'm guessing we're to assume it got to the right place. Um, so I just thought that was a nice little kind of unspoken chain throughout the movie. Like, nobody ever mentions the letter out loud, I don't think, after Carbazzo, Carbazzo dies. Um, so I thought that was really well done also. Um, and then um, there is a character that I guess you could say is a bit of a... Con I guess controversial character, I guess you could say. Because people have seemed to have, from what I've heard anyway, people have very passionate opinions about Upham, uh, Jeremy Davies' character, um, where I, there are a lot of people that see him as, like, sort of the audience surrogate, where while these guys have seen, like, the worst of the worst, um, Upham's a guy that feels like he was just sort of dropped into this uh, and hasn't seen what they've seen, so doesn't have the... He, just in general, he seems like a guy that's just not made for this, just not built for this at all. Um, and so he's kind of seen as the, um, where, like, an, an average, ordinary audience member could see themselves as him, where he's the guy that has never, you know, fired his rifle in anger and has never really seen just, I said, what, what the other guys have seen. Um, so whenever he finds himself in certain situations, um, there's a good chance he's either not going to know what to do at all, or he's going to freeze. Um, and in a sense, obviously, I think people could, like, the average person could really relate to that, to where it's like, if you could, you could watch a movie or play a video game and say, oh, if it were me, I would do this or this. Um, but if in that environment, especially if you haven't seen as much as the other guys you're with, uh, you're probably going to be completely and totally scared shitless and, and not know what to do. So we do get that moment where this comes to a complete head, where, when he's on the stairway and he freezes. And I think this is, and obviously this is where people start to, where the character gets a little controversial, because it's like, in a way you can relate to it and say, God knows what I would do in that situation, uh, if I would freeze also. Um, but the thing that sets people off is that this freezing on the stairway is what gets Mellish killed. Um, and in that sense, it's... I'd say it's justifiable to be very angry with Upham in that case. Um, even though he does finally, before the movie is over, um, see you know, the, the hell of it all for himself and does eventually make a decision that kind of brings him over to the side that's... While he's, while he's still maybe not seen all the shit that they've seen, he's starting to see the shit uh, by the end, making this final decision with Steamboat Willie. So, um, and then we kind of get the full character arc there. So I can understand where people are really kind of uh, unsure of how to take his character, but I think it's understandable from both sides. So um, there is that. Um, and, and yeah, I didn't mention, you know, uh, Jackson has always been one of my favorite characters also, the, the sniper played by Barry Pepper, um, the guy who's actually managed to, I, I really like the dialogue also when they're talking about, uh, the wrong way to gripe and the right way to gripe and how Edward Burns is doing it the wrong way and Jackson is the one that knows how to do it properly. Um, so st stuff like that also really just brings the connection between all of them together even more. Um... And as far as the characters in the Thin Red Line, um, obviously, like I said, we do see them from different... Like, they're, we actually get inside their head, and they get to take over uh, in a voiceover, and we get to see... Uh, most notably, uh, Wit, uh, who is Jim Caviezel's character, who um, obviously famously became the main character after Adrian Brody thought he was going to be the main character, but then mostly ended up on the editing room floor uh, without being told until the premiere when he saw the movie is when he figured it out. Um... So it's a shame that um, Caviezel's uh, kind of crucial role here is overshadowed a bit when you know that. Um, but at the same time, Caviezel has gone on to say that this absol this movie absolutely changed his career and changed his life in a really big way. And you can tell uh, just by his performance alone where he gets the opening scene uh, where he talks about... Because um, this, this actually goes on the Upham thing also because we were talking about how of him is kind of kind of feels like um, the spectator a lot in uh, Private Ryan, uh, where we have, we do have a spectator in the Thin Red Line, but it's a totally and completely different one. Um, where in this opening narration, before we get into uh, 
Caviezel's character with the uh, Melanesian natives, uh, where he's kind of found peace here, um, we're basically told that the spectator of this movie is nature itself, and basically the earth itself. Uh, basically living in its sort of natural beauty, and then watching from above as humanity sort of tears itself apart with war. Um, and just the constant contrast, because there are... Because Malik has been called a lot of things. There are a lot of people that like... To, just like a lot of people like to say that um, Private Ryan is, like, really, you know, overly patriotic, and it's Spielberg being way too sentimental or whatever. Um, Malik also gets a lot of criticisms for being... The word pretentious is thrown at Malik than I think many directors. Um, but the thing about... Especially his fascination with nature... And I have made those jokes in the past, especially with his more recent movies, um, how he'll linger more on something that seems insignificant rather than, you know, sticking with a scene. But in The Thin Red Line, um, it's like a whole other... I mean, you can make arguments for those other movies, but as far as The Thin Red Line goes, the fact that it's basically... The whole movie is told through nature's perspective um, is like a really really just a thought-provoking thing in general, and this really beautiful way to tell the story, and the way that those shots, every time he lingers on nature, um, it's kind of, you can just see the contrast of it, and it sort of living its natural life and beauty, and then uh, the carnage in the middle of it. Um, hence the scene where, like, we see the sun coming through the trees and all that, and there's the moment where... I think um, one of them is laying there and like reaches out to a plant, um, which is sort of nerve-wracking because it kind of reminds you of uh, the famous ending of All, All Quiet on the Western Front when the guy reaches out for the butterfly and gets himself killed. It uh, feels very reminiscent of that, almost like it's a callback to that intentionally. Um, but I don't think that, um, like I said, I think the whole looking at the... Because usually when you have... I don't want to completely generalize, but there are times where you'll find that um, one person likes one of these movies, so they find every way they can to be condescending towards the other. Um, so, like, if people love The Thin Red Line, they might be prone to say Saving Private Ryan is, you know, too sentimental, too patriotic or whatever, or over-patriotic or whatever, pandering, whatever they want to say. Whereas if somebody likes Saving Private Ryan and doesn't like The Thin Red Line, they might say that Malick's being pretentious and all that. And I think that's just really, really counterproductive. And what I was saying at the beginning, when it feels like... It feels like a complete experience where it's like Saving Private Ryan, we see the worst of the worst, and then The Thin Red Line gives us the time to, like, meditate on it, even though it also has a lot of the battle scenes in it also. Um... But there's, and also the way they uh, handle, like, um, I was going to talk more about the characters after I talked about Caviezel. I got sidetracked with what Caviezel was talking about at the beginning. Um, some of the real standout characters here are, um, two of the characters that really stand out when a lot of people talk about it are Saros and Tall, um, Alex Gattias and Nick Nolte, and their whole storyline. Um, and, and yeah, it's, what, what I really love is another sort of contrast. There's a lot of one thing contrasting with another in this movie, and I think that's another thing that makes it so, uh, beautiful and combative with itself, is, uh, we've got, um, Star Wars over here is this really sort of, he's got, definitely got, like, a sensitivity inside him, and he's the one where, when he sees certain death, he wants to make sure that regardless of the mission, that that doesn't happen to his men. Like, he can't, he can't willingly just escort them to their deaths like that, despite the fact that he's being um, ordered to by Tall, who is this extreme... Like, obviously, um, Tegas performance is this really amazingly subtle, sort of sensitive thing, perfectly contrasting the absolute fucking powerhouse that is Nick Nolte in this movie. Um, easily one of his best performances, and that's a pretty high bar. Um, and there's this... I really love the moment when... Uh, they're all, I think it's after all this, um, and Nolte's standing there, and they're all kind of on the ground, um, and it just says everything about his character in one image, um, and as they're all there, um, this explosion goes off, like, right in front of them, uh, and while everybody kind of ducks or flinches, uh, Nolte standing there is just a brick wall, like, he doesn't even flinch, and this explosion was, like, right behind him. Um, and I think that, that in itself, just imagery like that, just says everything about this character without everything else we've already seen up to this point. Um, 
and the way we sort of have that um, that whole battle within itself between those two characters, and then it says a lot about you know the whole situation itself. But then there's also um, when you want to compare it to another scene in Private Ryan, when at some point the characters have to reach this moment of defiance, um, and how both characters that make that decision end up paying the price for it in one way or another. Because um, here you've obviously got Star saying that he won't do that, uh, and it results in him being sent home, um, despite making what many would believe to be a noble decision. Um, and then with Private Ryan, we've got the scene with uh, the radar station, when obviously they're still feeling resentment, and they're saying, you know, going to get one particular person is not our job. Our job is to do what we came here to do. So when they reach this radar station, Miller comes to the conclusion that if we're going to do this, then we're also going to do what we came here to do, and we're going to, you know, take this. So this decision obviously ultimately leads to actually a couple of things, um, because there's the whole release of Steamboat Willie, which uh, obviously ends up indirectly leading to Miller's death. Um, but then there's also the loss of Wade happens in this scene. Um, and we finally get the scene where we were talking about how Miller has all that inside him. And we do finally, when nobody's around, we finally get to see him break down. Um, so it's like, in a way, we feel like we understand why they think they would make the right decision. But then, like I said, at the same time, it's inevitable that they pay some kind of price for it. Um, so I thought that was beautifully handled in two totally different ways in both movies as well. Um, and also the little ways they touch on, uh, home life. Like, we talked about the Ben Chaplin scenes really stand out, and like I said, how cerebral they feel, uh, when we see him with his wife and those memories, and how, like, it's it, to the point that we're not even totally sure if we're looking at, like, um, like, fantasies of him getting back home or memories that have already happened at home. Um, and then we have stuff like, uh, like I'm talking about, even in dialogue, um, when Miller talks about, you know, how will his wife see him, will she recognize him? But another scene that really stands out is one at the beginning, um, where you can kind of see it, you can take it, like, both metaphorically and literally, um, when Mrs. Ryan is about to be informed about the deaths of the other brothers, um, and it's the car coming up, like, this really long road, and it's like, you can, obviously you can see the metaphor of the long road of, for both of them. Like, for her, it's a really, really long road because she knows what this means. She just doesn't know, like, what exactly has happened and how many of her kids are dead and all that. And just the anticipation of that car coming. But then it's also, from their perspective, it's got to be a long road for them, knowing once they get to the end of this road, they've got to tell her what's happened and that three of her sons are dead. Um, so that I always thought that was really well handled also. Um... And then you have these moments, like, um, like I said, more, more individual moments with uh, the Thin Red Line cast would be, we talked about some of the individual death scenes here in Private Ryan, we've also got Woody Harrelson's really memorable death scene. Um, when he, the great thing about this character is that this moment where he is pulled the pin off the grenade, um, and he has to throw himself against like this embankment in order to not made make this mistake where he talks about uh like the first thing he screams after it happens is it was it was such a recruit thing to do like it was such a rookie mistake to make um but like his very first instinct was to make sure that nobody else paid the price for his mistake so he just throws himself up against the wall um and that's really and this moment really kind of comes to a head when Caviezel's there to basically say you know you didn't let us down by doing that and making that instinctive decision so quickly um so, and the fact that that was his first instinct is like really says something about a character that we really didn't know too well, no more or less than we know some of the other characters. Um, but moments like that just completely make them stand out. Um, and then there was also, um, uh, what else do we have? There's uh, the Sean Penn character. Um, and the fact that he's kind of the. Uh, almost feels like kind of the all-seeing one where it's like no matter which character we branch off to and which story we kind of get and which way we kind of follow um whether it be you know nolte or john cusack or caviezel or any of them we always kind of seem to find our way back to Penn. um and so that character's kind of there to add sort of a like it can almost seem like it's all over the place but it feels with him like there's a sort of cohesion the way we kind of see all the guys individually, it always feels like we have a place to come back to, uh, which kind of gives it a feel of, like, 
a bit of an organization to make I guess make the movie easier to it could have made the, they could have made the movie a bit harder to sort of differentiate and all that but everything feels like it and it could have been a bit felt a bit too disjointed like they, they wouldn't have felt too much um like a brother like we were bouncing around too much the way we see in private ryan where they're all kind of always together um penn's character kind of feels like that cohesion that we need to really feel that so um i really like that that's in here um and then uh what else one, one thing i wanted to mention also was the um the thing that really stood, I, I, I can't speak too much on this with the Thin Red Line, but um, because I just saw Saving Private Ryan in a theater, um, it had never really occurred to me how good the sound is. Um, like, that's how that's how I was noticing um, when uh, Cavarzo falls on a piano was the first time I noticed that was in a theater, um, when I could tell the difference. And then there was the whole, obviously the whole opening scene uh, in a theater is a totally different experience from watching it, say, on a TV or a laptop or something. Um, and then you've got this one scene that really stands out, uh, when they're in the church, I think it is, um, and they're just kind of all lit only by candlelight, and they're all kind of telling their stories, um, most notably Wade's story about his mom, um, but when we kind of hear the noise in the background, and we see, like, flashes, and in some cases it sounds like thunder and lightning, it sounds like thunder and looks like lightning, and then other times it could be the sound and the appearance of bombs going off or explosions in the way distance. And what it sounded like to me was it was, like, alternating. Like, to the point to where you're never quite sure if you're, you know, hearing bombs going off or not, and that sort of almost paranoia about it. Um, and I, I could swear the sound was going back and forth between it being the sound of thunder and lightning and then the sound of explosions in the distance. Uh, and it just kind of alternated. Um, so I thought that was really well done also, assuming that's what they were doing. Um, and the scores also are worth noting for both of these, where obviously Williams uh, brings something really memorable to Private Ryan. Um, there's, like, if there's one moment that kind of stands out in a weird way, it would probably be the dog tag scene. Um, which is a scene that I love when they're going through the dog tags and they're looking for Ryan and Wade has to intervene as the guys are walking by because it's like throwing these guys as dog tags around like they're nothing is basically like you might as well be throwing around the men themselves um, as their you know, other brothers walk by. Um, so, <clears throat> but anyway, that scene, um, the score in that scene almost seemed kind of weird. Uh, like it was a leftover from like his Home Alone score or something, which uh, seemed bizarre at the time, and I'd never really noticed it until I heard it in the theater. But apart from that, um, that's great. But obviously, Zimmer's score for the Thin Red Line is like the stuff of legend. Um, like there, there are pieces in there that everybody knows, whether they know it or not, because they've heard it in maybe a trailer or another video or another movie even. Um, so there's the uh, there's also. Um, the end, the end credits song, which is one of the really famous pieces of the movie, was also used in Mr. Nobody, I think, which also had Jared Leto in it. Um, so that so that also really stands out. Also, I've heard some people claim that Zimmer's score for Thin Red Line might be one of the very best scores of, like, all time. Um, and I don't think many people would argue with that. So, um, I'm trying to think out, figure out if there's anything else uh, I really wanted to touch on here. Um, I would say... And obviously, like I said, they are they are all going to have those individual moments in between. Like I was talking about um, how the Thin Red Line has pretty, you know, is overlooked for how well its battle scenes are done also, particularly like the moment when Jared Leto's killed and then just those really, you know, heart racing shots across the grass as everything starts to happen. Um, it's so really well done. And then you have the stuff like the individual moments of Bright Ryan, like in the opening scene with... Uh, the Czech guys who come out and try to surrender and say that they're Czech, but because, you know, that there's no, there's a language barrier there, they end up getting killed. Sort of like, um, somewhat mirrors what happens with Wit's death at the end of the Thin Red Line, um, where it's like, um, which is an incredibly active scene by Kavi, so that look on his face is like something that will never leave your mind ever once you've seen it. Um, and there's like the whole, to my understanding, the communication was the Japanese telling him, like, um, just surrender and we won't kill you. I mean, it's like, not to say what would happen to him if he did surrender, but he's going to die in this moment if he doesn't, and they're giving him that opportunity. Um, but then, obviously, he raises his gun, and we know, we know the character of Wit well enough that there's, 
there wasn't an intention to fire his gun when he raised it. Uh, that was a choice, uh, which comes back to the opening scene when he was his narration when he talks about his mother uh, brings that full circle. So it's like one of the one of the more beautiful death scenes uh, in a war movie, if not all movies. Um, so and I've heard, I actually heard a lot of argument that um, some people think that it's even kind of doing it a disservice to classify the Thin Red Line as just a war movie, because um, it almost feels like it transcends it a little bit. Um, I think Caviezel was quoted as calling the movie itself like a prayer, um, which is really interesting. And then there was, like I said, the, way, the just the impact it had with Caviezel saying it changed his life. I know um, Alaska Tais was actually doing an interview. Um, he was doing like a, just a general q and I think, and somebody asked him about the Thin Red Line, and he said that he actually categorizes his life because of it. Like, not not just his career, but his life he categorizes as what happened before the Thin Red Line and what happened after the Thin Red Line. Um, so it's like that, that kind of power um, is something you can only see with maybe a handful of movies. And the, the impact and the effect that this movie has had on just its cast and its viewers and all that just seems to have really been... Because the thing about it was, and I'm almost ashamed to admit it now, but um, I used to not be much of a Malick fan. I think this was my first Malick movie, and I was probably a bit too young when I saw it to really appreciate what Malick was doing. Because um, he was just, you know, like the, the director that cared about nature uh, and just left it at that. But the thing is, is I, I didn't watch it again for the long time because when I watched it, I like hated it because I guess I didn't know what to expect because I wasn't familiar with Malick as a filmmaker and the type of filmmaker that he was. So, a long time passed, and I, def I desperately need to get the Criterion Blu-ray, I really do. Um, I finally watched it again, and then just instantly for the entire three hours, it just knocked me right on my ass. Uh, and I was like, almost to the point that it did not even feel like the same movie I saw when I was younger. It was like, I... I did not. I did not know this movie after I had seen it the first time, um, and in that second time, like I said, it just felt like an entirely different movie. Um, and once I kind of got to know Malik as a filmmaker, also, and get the general idea of what you know he was doing when he made it, and the things he was trying to say and convey, and all that, um, and it's just a beautiful goddamn movie. It really is. I would say if I had to choose between the two. Um, I'd probably go more towards Private Ryan only because um, I, I love the characters in it and I'm just kind of a sucker for like a narrative. It's definitely a much more narrative driven movie than The Thin Red Line is. Um, but I mean that's the kind of the lack of narrative is many of the strengths of The Thin Red Line um, where it is just more about the experience itself and thinking about in everything that it leads to thinking about and the whole, like I said, just the whole being a meditative process on everything that we see leading up to it and it's like, and yeah, you watch Private Ryan and you watch The Thin Red Line. Thin Red Line is probably the one you're going to be thinking about a lot more, for sure. Um, but I still think that sort of takes, like, Private Ryan is still kind of overlooking how much it can do that also, even though it's just mainly seen as the, the more graphic and visceral of the two. Um, but I think they both really accomplish the same thing. I said, watching them together, different as they seem and from two totally different perspectives as they seem, I feel like together they make one really complete experience. Um, so that's how I feel about these. Uh, so the next one is going to be another versus uh, that I've had planned for a while. And then, yeah, and then we're going to do the, we're going to talk about Kevin Costner's baseball movies. So, because the next... Uh, screening they're doing, uh, classic screening they're doing is for Field of Dreams, so I'll be catching that over the next weekend, and then we'll talk about those. So uh, until all that, uh, I think that's it for this.